Is grass-fed beef actually healthier, or is it just expensive marketing hype? Now, I just graduated with my doctorate and was fortunate enough to work under pioneering researcher Dr. Stefan Van Vliet at the Center for Human Nutrition Studies at Utah State University, and they are studying things there that have never been measured in food before. We're talking about 30,000 compounds in beef, not the 13 nutrients found on a food label, but 30,000. And why does that matter? Because it means the food we eat is far more complex than we've ever given it credit for. Those thousands of compounds, many still unnamed, play a huge role in inflammation, metabolism, energy, gut health, and even how satisfied you feel after eating. And what Dr. Van Vliet has found will surprise you and has the power to measurably improve your health. So today, I'm breaking down the six research-backed differences between grass-fed and grain-fed beef based on his groundbreaking work. And spoiler alert, number three is going to completely change how you think about meat, so let's dive in. Meat. Truly the Beef Nutrient the Density Project. The attention of the scientific world to the existence of vitamins. Beef contains an estimated 30,000 unique metabolites. are needed for proper growing, answering, the creatine, that emerge the with grass-fed grass beef, and with grain-fed grain beef, form. your blood is going to look different. True meat. Okay. Difference number one is omega-3 fatty acids. Now, I know what you're thinking. Autumn, I get my omega-3s from fish, and that's great. But the reality is, most people still don't get enough. In fact, Harvard Research estimates around 84,000 Americans die every single year due to omega-3 deficiency, which can negatively impact your brain, heart, eyes, and immune function. And that's one reason I'm so excited about what Dr. Van Vliet's team found in beef, because it turns out the type of beef you eat can quietly make a big difference in your omega-3 intake too. But what we found there essentially is, is that on average, grass-fed beef is higher in omega-3 fatty acids. The phytonutrients are, two, are maybe two, two, three times higher. The omega-3 fatty acids are also three times higher. Fat-soluble vitamins are, are also increased. Did you catch that? Three times higher in omega-3s. That means in this study, you could eat three grain-fed steaks or one grass-fed steak to get the same amount of omega-3s. And this is one of the reasons Dr. Van Vliet believes omega-3 research from beef has been underestimated. I think one thing that's often forgotten in these discussions is we focus on EPA and DHA. But DPA, the gosopentanoic acid, is also an omega-3 fatty acid and it's actually particularly rich in, in, in terrestrial animal source food, so things that walk on land. Dr. Van Vliet just completed a four-month human trial, one of the longest studies ever done in this area, with 80 participants. Half ate conventional meat and eggs, and the other half ate pasteurized versions. And they measured what happened to the omega-3s in people's red blood cells. Average American has an omega-6 to 3 ratio in their red blood cells of about 9. So there's more longevity here in Utah, and I think people are a little bit, on average, a little bit healthier. But our control group had an omega-6 to 3 ratio of uh, about 5. It dropped to about 2.5 in the 2.5 uh, to 3 in the pasture group. They had a, a quite a considerable improvement. This is really important given that researchers believe you want to be at a four to one ratio or lower for optimal health and the impact may be more powerful than previously believed. There's this long-standing idea while you see increases in omega-3s from pasture finished animal source foods that they are meaningless because they're quite small, right? The, the absolute amount is quite small. If you look at the literature, there's been multiple studies out of the UK, one out of France, a few out of Australia, they all find that if you increase intake of pastured animal source foods, you can increase omega-3s in the blood of people. So, but if you look at an Excel spreadsheet, you think like, wow, maybe this jump in omega-3s from 30 milligrams to 60, 70 milligrams is not that meaningful. And maybe that's true if we give that to you in a, in a pill form. But this comes back to this idea we talked about earlier, this whole food matrix that you get more bang for your buck. So it seems that getting these within whole foods raises the levels more than you can uh, anticipate from an Excel spreadsheet. And this is what I love about this research. It's not just about what's on the label or the absolute amount of something in a food. It's about what your body actually absorbs and uses. The whole food matrix matters. So if you're trying to improve your omega-3 status, and most of us are deficient, grass-fed beef can meaningfully contribute, especially since most people eat meat far more often than they eat fish. 20, 30 years of research behind it is omega-3 fatty acids. Really, I would say the key issue is, is there's low intakes of omega-3s in our diet. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that has health benefits. So yeah, I would argue that any way by which we can increase the omega-3s within our diet is, is a good thing. 
Okay, difference number two is fat-soluble vitamins and nutrients. Now this is huge, especially if you're someone who struggles with nutrient deficiencies like most of us. It is higher in fat-soluble vitamins and associated nutrients. So we're talking vitamins A, D, E, and K, and vitamins that help with everything from bone health to immune function to hormone production, and even beta-carotene, a precursor to vitamin A that gives foods their orange and yellow color. In our paper, we also found higher levels of certain minerals. Some minerals were a little bit higher in grass-fed beef, such as zinc and iron and uh, selenium, but it is about maybe 10, 20%. So you could argue, does that have any clinical relevance? Um, it, it, it probably depends on your baseline intake. But also the getting your minerals from animal foods or a combination of plant and animal foods is very important. I mean, even know from studies that for instance, let's say you have a chili and you throw in beans and beef, you actually get a better absorption of the iron from those beans because it mm -hmm. has beef in there. We don't know exactly what the factors are called, the animal uh, factors, but yep. there's these, again, these, these things that do not appear in the nutrition facts panel, but that are sort of the magic of the whole foods, right? Now here's what's fascinating. These vitamins are directly tied to what the animals ate. Think about it. Grass-fed cows are out in the pasture eating fresh, diverse plants. They're getting carotenoids from those plants, which then get stored in their fat and muscle tissue. And when you eat that beef, you're getting those nutrients too. And grain-fed cows, they're eating mostly corn and soy in a feedlot. No fresh grass, no diverse plants, no carotenoids. But one interesting finding is that grain-fed beef can be higher in certain vitamins. B1, B5 are a little bit higher in grain-fed beef. Why? Because which foods are rich in grains, or which B vitamins are rich in grains, thiamine and, and, and vitamin B5. So overall, grass-fed beef seems to contain more vitamin A and E and minerals like zinc, iron, and selenium, and copper, which over time adds up. And given that 90% of Americans are deficient, this is a big deal. Okay, this is the difference that truly surprised me when I first learned about this research, and that's that phytonutrients or plant compounds that have well-demonstrated benefits like anti-inflammation, antidepressant, cancer protective, etc., seem to be concentrated in the meat and milk of animals fed grass, especially on diverse pastures. Now, some research suggesting the amounts can be equivalent to certain plant foods like squash and turnips, though it comes with an important caveat. There is a nuance. It's, that it's not the same compound you find in the turnip as in the animal typically so you get a, you get a metabolism so the animal might take those those polyphenols from from its forages uh, it, the gut microbiota modulate that or bio transform some of those compounds into different compounds so the gut microbiome plays a key, key role in that but it, it produces polyphenol derived metabolites that liver especially because that's where a lot of these things are bio transformed do accumulate a good amount of those uh, th those phytonutrients so here's what's happening when a cow is out on pasture eating dozens of different plant species grasses herbs wildflowers they're consuming tons of polyphenols and phytonutrients now those compounds get processed by the cow's gut bacteria and liver transforming them into new compounds and some of those transformed compounds end up in the meat especially in organ meats like liver. Now, Dr. Van Vliet was very careful to say we're still studying whether these compounds benefit human health directly, but here's what they do know. Pretty confidently stating it's definitely benefiting the metabolic health of the animal. Yeah. So mm -hmm. The animal's definitely healthier. The animal has less oxidative stress, less information, better glucose metabolic health, better mitochondrial health, better liver health. The animal is healthier. Yeah. Whether eating a healthier animal makes us healthier, that I don't, that we don't know yet. And to me, it makes sense that eating a healthier animal would benefit us too. Not to mention, this completely changes the plant versus animals debate. Because what we're learning is that when you eat grass-fed beef, you're also getting plant compounds just in pre-processed and bioavailable form. Animal ate, I don't know, maybe a good amount of like, let's say wild onion or something like that. Or it ate a lot of something that's rich in sage. You'll taste some of those metabolites very subtly. Um, so yeah, th that's why I would say, are you grass-fed beef? You taste the terroir, the territory, right? The environment. So meat is truly a photograph of the land. Now benefit four, it may reduce inflammation over time. There was a 2010 study revealing that eating grass-fed kangaroo resulted in significantly less post-meal inflammation than grain-fed beef. And while Dr. Van Vliet did run a similar trial with plant-based burgers, grain-fed and grass-fed beef without finding much acute difference, a four-month trial where he compared eating an all-regenerative diet with pastured animal products and produce versus a conventional whole food diet and a standard American diet 
did reveal there may be a benefit. The difference between not consuming a standard American diet and a whole foods diet is probably larger than consuming a bunch of eating 90% whole foods from conventional versus regenerative agriculture. Not to say that the regenerative agriculture cannot provide additional benefits. That's at least what, what the data would suggest, but it's, it's smaller. Difference number five, not all grass-fed beef is created equal. Now this one is so, so important if you're spending extra money on grass-fed beef. Not all grass-fed beef is the same. But another interesting finding is, is that grass-fed isn't grass-fed isn't grass-fed, and grain-fed isn't grain-fed either. So there's tremendous variation among grass-fed. Mm -hmm. There's quite a bit of variation amongst grain fat too. And actually, maybe this might be surprising to some people, some grain fat samples were more nutrient dense than the least nutrient dense grass fat samples. Surprising, right? Now, how is this possible? Also, there's legacy effects, right? Like, let's say if the animal prior to going into that feedlot was on a very biodiverse pasture, we know that they start high in phytonutrients and fat soluble vitamins and omega 3, so the drop is probably less. Cons consequently, if the grass fed animal is on a very monoculture overgrazed pasture, it already is not probably the, the most nutrient dense a producer that got the stillage grain from a local microbrewery. That mm -hmm. microbrewery was probably also using grains that is uh, you know, high quality because they wanted to, wanted to make high quality beer out of it. So uh, sourcing from more uh, regenerative systems already. Fed those the stillage grains to animals on pasture uh, during, during the finishing phase. For instance, that sample was in, indistinguishable from grass fat. Wow. Uh, so those are, are, are key nuances, but in general, we found that animals that were rotationally grazed on plant diverse pastures were the most nutrient dense. So here's the deal, a grass fed cow on an overgrazed depleted pasture with only one type of grass. This might not be that nutrient dense, but a cow that's rotationally grazed on diverse pastures with 10 or more different plant species, now that's where you see real nutrient density. And this is why I always say, don't just look for grass fed on the label, ask questions. How diverse are the pastures? Are they rotationally grazed? How long are the animals on pasture? And are they grass finished? Even though it's super common to see that grass fed or grain fed, is that maybe pasture finished or feedlot finished is a more accurate the, the description. And here's another fascinating finding. Dr. Van Vliet found that the number of plant species in the pasture, up to 10, was directly correlated with higher omega-3s in the beef, meaning more plant diversity equals more nutrient-dense beef. Difference number six, the soil to human connection. Okay, one final difference, and this one ties everything together. Dr. Van Vliet discovered a compound that creates a direct line from the soil to the meat and all the way to your body, and it's called ergothionine. So ergothionine is a compound that is produced by uh, certain bacteria and fungi within the soil. It starts in the soil, makes its way up to the plant, makes its way up to the animal, and that animal can be a cow or us. We saw that, so we saw higher amounts of that in grass-fed beef versus grain-fed beef as well and we, we think that's a marker of, 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 of soil health. What this tells us is that the health of the soil may directly impact the health of the plant, which impacts the health of the animal, which may impact your health. So we published a paper in uh, Nature Science of Food, I think in probably was November of this year. Intuitively, or, or at least hypo hypothetically, and farmers observe this particularly, is that there's linkages between soil health, plant health, and animal health and potentially also human health. But there had been surprisingly little work done to, uh, to, to try to confirm those things. We wanted to see if we, are there compounds that we can measure that can provide that linkage, that make their way up to the food web, a direct line of evidence with, uh, with soil properties. And ergothionine isn't just a marker, it might actually have health benefits. There's been a lot of studies done on the compound ergothionine, specifically in the, com in the context of uh, mushrooms, because it's a fungi, so it's rich in that. So, yes, it does seem it has antioxidant effects and anti-inflammatory effect. Yes, it does seem that the, the, I would say the research we are in is the evidence moderately strong to suggest that this could have a, a human health benefit. So when you choose beef from regeneratively grazed healthy soil, you're getting novel compounds from healthy soil biology, which is why I'm so passionate about regenerative agriculture. It's not just about the environment, though that matters too. It's about the quality of the food we're putting in our bodies, and Dr. Van Vliet's research is giving us the data that proves it has benefits. Okay, so what do we do with all of this information? Let me give you my top takeaways. 
One, if you can afford grass-fed and regeneratively raised beef, prioritize it, but ask questions. Don't just trust the label. As of 2016, no one is really regulating whether grass-fed beef is actually grass-finished. So find out about the grazing practices and pasture diversity. Ask if the meats are grass-finished or feedlot finished. You can also look for AGA certification, American Grass-Fed Association, which means the animals are grass-finished, or check out Wild Pastures, our meat delivery service sourced exclusively from American family farmers using regenerative practices. Number two, if you're at a restaurant with no grass-fed option, maybe just order the steak. I probably order steak, yeah, most, most, uh, yeah. No, no, I mean, it's this bigger picture, right? It's not like you're gonna eat a great feedlot finished beef and all of a sudden your health is gonna fall apart or anything <laughs> like that. The omega-6 to 3 ratio in beef, even grain-fed, is better than chicken or pork from conventional systems, which can be 10 to 1 or even 20 to 1. Number three, source locally when you can. Farmers markets, local ranchers, even Facebook marketplace. Dr. Van Vliet sources a lot of his food that way, and so do I. Number four, remember the benefits of nutrient-dense food accumulate over time. So this isn't about one perfect meal, it's about consistent choices over months and years. Number five, if grass-fed beef isn't in your budget yet, don't stress, just eat a whole foods diet. Dr. Van Vliet was very clear about this. Just not consuming a standard American diet makes you a whole lot healthier. Uh, just not eating all the processed food. And, and if, if you start studying fruits and vegetables and grain fed beef, you're still gonna get a lot healthier than, uh, than our ultra processed diet. Even conventional beef is way better than a donut or ultra processed food. The biggest dietary change you can make is just eating more whole foods and upgrade your meat whenever you can, knowing that money spent on high quality meat is also a vote for a better system. Now, what I love most about Dr. Van Vliet's work is that it's not dogmatic. He's not saying you have to eat grass fed or you're doomed. He's saying, here's the data, here's what we're learning, make the best choices you can with the resources you have. And honestly, that's the approach I, I tried to take with everything on this channel. So if you found this valuable, please hit the like button and subscribe. We're covering so many nutrition topics like this every week and cutting through the noise, giving you real research you can actually use. So drop a comment and let me know, do you buy grass-fed beef? Are you gonna start asking different questions now? I read every comment, so I'll see you in the next one.